Hey, this is Mike from the One Stop Co-op Shop, and we're doing something a little different today, showing a solo variant that I designed myself for Undaunted Normandy. If you've watched the channel recently, you probably already know that I love David Thompson Designs, and this is one of his collaborations that I had not played, but I wanted to, but sadly it's only competitive and I wanted to try out solo. So I asked the publisher if they would send me one, saying that I would check out the solo variants already on Board Game Geek, and they did, but then I found I didn't really like any of those, so I just made my own. And yes, I've done variants before for Quirky Circuits and Magic Maze, but this one was really much more of a design trying to do a fully featured AI for the game that's challenging. So I'm going to show it to you, and I have the files linked. Check it out and see if you like it. I'm going to quickly go through the basics of setup and rules for Undaunted Normandy, kind of taking the AI out of it for a moment. But if you already know the game, skip past all of that using the timestamps and just see me play through and explain the AI system. So here we've got the scenario book for Undaunted Normandy, which I should say is a 1v1 tactical deck building World War II game. And for today, I'm showing you scenario three. One and two kind of feel like just tutorials. This feels like the first kind of full scenario. I'm going to be controlling the Germans, who I think have a bit of a disadvantage in this scenario, and the AI will be the US. So you'll see the scenario book tells you how to set up the map, which units are where, which tiles have scouted and control tokens on them, what places are worth how many victory points. It'll also tell you how to set up each deck. The dark Ds here means it's already in the deck, and the lighter Ss mean that it's in the supply that you can add to your deck later. And finally, you've got the objective. The US and the Germans have the same objective in this one, to be the first to get six objective points. So here's the German side of the map in more detail. You'll see I've got a Rifleman and Scout unit in Squad A, and also a Rifleman and Scouts in Squad B. And I have a little triangle of tiles scouted, these little binocular symbols. And that includes one one objective point tile, and then the entire river is worth objective points, but the bridge is worth three, whereas these are each worth one. And you might notice right off the bat, if I capture the entire river, that adds up to one, two, three, six, enough to win the scenario. On the U.S. side of things, they also have six victory points. They already have two captured, and they have another one right next to them in this building, although it's not scouted. But then their final six victory points, if they want to go that route, are all the way over here to the east, though they can just go down and try to take some of the river spaces down here. And they start off with a fully symmetrical force, same as mine, a Rifleman and Scout, Rifleman and Scout for Squad A and B. And like I already mentioned, the only other part of setup is to get your card supply set up. Here are mine for the German side. And you also build and shuffle your deck, which is a mix of some of these cards, specifically the Rifleman and Scout ones, plus some command cards and a few starting Fog of Wars, which are dead cards in the deck building sense. And with our deck supplies and the map set up, we just have to set the starting initiative, which is with the Germans in this scenario. Now getting to the basics of play, not focus on AI play, but it's the game in general. Each player draws four cards at the start of the turn, and they're going to look at these four cards and simultaneously choose one of them to put face down as their secret initiative choice for the turn. And all that matters for initiative is this value in the upper left. Higher means more likely for you to seize the initiative. Once both players have chosen their card, they reveal it, and whoever has the higher value gains the initiative, and you flip the token there. And the token matters going forward because if there's a tie in initiative card values, then it stays with whoever currently has the initiative. Whichever player wins initiative plays their three cards remaining in whatever order they like. Most cards will specify a specific unit, so here are the Rifleman from Squad A, and will give them several options of actions they could take. They're going to pick one of these. Some cards, though, are command cards and don't represent an actual unit on the board, but they still will have options for actions, and you'll choose one of them. And like I said before, if you end up with some Fog of War cards, you can't play these. They just kind of sit in your hand and get discarded at the end of the turn. Once the player with initiative finishes resolving all of their cards, the player without initiative will go, although they might be down some cards if their units took damage during the turn. And now I'm going to quickly go through the actions for the units in this scenario. Riflemen are, in a way, your most important because they're the only ones that can control objectives and get you the points you need to win. So first they can move one space. And that just means picking them up and moving them into an adjacent tile, but it needs to be a tile with binoculars or a control token on it, which means it's been scouted previously, so Rifleman can't just move into No Man's Land without a scout helping them out first. Secondly, they can attack for one die. We'll show you that in a moment. And third, if they're on a control point, they can control it. Basically, that means they just flip their scouted token to a control token, and now those points count for their victory. This would be one out of six in this case. Now, in the rules as printed in the rulebook, if an enemy unit is in a space, you cannot take the control action. So here you'd kind of be in a stalemate until one of these guys defeated the other. 
But if a rifleman is on an objective without an enemy unit, even if the enemy controls it, their control action will still give them control and take away control for the enemy. Scouts have their own action. First, they can scout two. And that's the same as the rifleman's movement, except they can move up to two tiles. And they can move into tiles that aren't scouted, and when they do so, they leave a scouted token, which means now a rifleman can go in there. But every time you do that, push into the unknown, your lines of communication break down a bit, and you have to add a Fog of War card to your deck for each tile that was newly scouted. Scouts can also attack for one die like riflemen, but they can also deal with Fog of War cards with a recon action. If you have both a Scout card and a Fog of War card in your hand, you can use the Scout card to take a recon action. You put the Fog of War card back in the supply, basically trashing it from your deck, and you get to draw a replacement card from your deck, so it's not like you've even lost any tempo. And the final action a Scout can take is to Conceal, which just means to put a Fog of War card in their opponent's deck, slowing down their progress. The final unit type for this scenario, which neither of us starts with in our deck or on the board, is the Machine Gunner. They can also move one, they can attack, although for two dice instead of one, so twice as good as the others, and they have an alternative attack option called Suppression, which is kind of a weaker attack, but they get four dice instead of two. And I've mentioned attacking quite a bit, let's get to how it works. If a unit wants to attack another unit, this game abstracts everything, there's no line of sight, you can shoot wherever you want. But you do have to calculate your target's defense, and that's pretty simple. Each unit has a base defense value, so scouts, for example, have five, machine gunners and riflemen have four. And you add to that the number of tiles in between you, not counting the firer's tiles. So for the scouts here, it'd be one, two, raising the defense to seven. And you also add the cover value of the tile the target is on. So in this case, the woods would give them a whopping plus three, raising their defense all the way to ten. And the defense value you arrive at is the amount you have to roll on your attack to hurt them. So clearly a one would not cut it here. But even if the defense goes above 10, you'll always still hit on a 10. So basically just cap defense at 10, even if you're shooting across the entire board. When you hit a unit with an attack, you remove a card matching that unit from the enemy's deck. First you check your hand if you had initiative and they haven't gone yet, which means you could actually take away one of their cards for the turn. If there isn't one in their hand, you check their discard pile, then you check their deck. If there are no cards left for that unit in the player's entire deck, they are removed from the board, although they might have the chance to be respawned later. And when that card is removed, it doesn't go back into the supply to be bought again. It's actually taken out of the game entirely, which means eventually you could have a unit just run out of cards and be impossible to respawn them at all. And by the way, back to our friendly machine gunner, even though he rolls two attack dice, it only matters if you get at least one hit. Rolling two hits instead of one doesn't actually affect the target anymore. And if you hit with suppression, you just flip the target over, and that means the next time they would act, they instead just flip over, and that's their entire action. Finally, we have our command cards. In this scenario, just the platoon sergeant and the squad leaders. The platoon sergeant can be played to command two, which just means you draw two more cards into your hand. Or he can bolster three. And the squad leader can also bolster, but only units in his squad. And I'll show you what that means in a second. And then finally, the squad leader can inspire for his squad. What that means is, let's say I already played a Rifleman A card and had Rifleman A take an action. The squad leader's inspire one only for A, he couldn't do it to squad B, lets me take that other card back into my hand, and now I can play it again and basically have him do a second action. And what does bolstering mean? Well, it's pretty simple deck building. You just pick that many cards, take them from the supply, and add them to your discard pile, shuffling them into your deck the next time you go through it. The only key distinction is that the squad leaders, because they have A or B or C based on their squad, can only pick cards from that squad. They can't uh, bolster into other cards. And a final note, anytime you play a card that is not a Fog of War, instead of doing an action with it, you can just do what's called hunkering down, which means you just cull it from your deck if you don't feel like you want to activate those units anymore. So that's it for the basics of Play of Undaunted Normandy. Now let's get to my solo variant. My solo rules are contained on these nine cards, and I have the file link in the video description. And they're basically going to govern what the AI does on their turn, who they want to attack, what scouts will do, how their turn kind of works out in general. And one of my goals for the variant was for it to play pretty much just like the real game. So I haven't really broken any major rules except one. And that's actually a change for the play experience, not for the variant itself. Basically, I took the control rules from Undaunted North Africa, the second entry in the series, and ported them over to here, which I will say is something that the designers support as a variant, because when you play with the control rules as written, the game can kind of get slogged down sometimes. So control of my variant works all the same as in the rules, except for one thing. If an enemy unit is on a tile, you can still take the control action and seize control of the space. 
The only way for them to block you from controlling is to have control themselves and have an enemy unit there. So what this means is I can't run a scout in and deny you the objective until you defeat that scout. I have to actually schlep my rifleman over and control it myself to stop you from doing so. With that one rules change out of the way, I'm going to actually play the scenario and just kind of talk you through the AI stuff as they do it. So for my starting hand, I got two scouts, a rifleman and a squad leader. I think I want to try to grab one of the objectives right off the bat. So the squad leader will help the rifleman do a double move for that. I'm going to use my scout with a six value for my initiative for the round. Now how the AI does initiative is very simple. You just take the top card of their deck and put it down. Once you've decided on yours, you flip it and see if they won. In this case, they played a Fog of War, so I'm going to have initiative. You also get their hand of cards ready. And the standard difficulty, because they sometimes make suboptimal decisions, is to have them draw four cards, which is one more than you, because don't forget, they already used their initiative cards. That's five for the round in total. If you want an easier game against the AI, you can just give them the same three as yourself, but trust me, you'll probably win. And if you want to kick things up to an insane level, give them five cards plus their initiative, and uh, good luck. I'm going to put these four cards aside because if I damage them during my turn, I need to check and see if I actually took out any cards. So first I'm going to play my scout card and scout two tiles. I want to get to this majorly valuable bridge tile scouted. Then I'm going to have my A squad of riflemen move into the objective. I already have scouted here. Then I'm going to play squad leader A to inspire my riflemen and give them a control action. So there, we've got one out of our six points. And when my turn is done, I discard all of the cards for the turn, my initiative card and the other three. Now for the AI turn, what I'm going to do is lay out their four cards. And I'm going to order them in initiative order from high to low, left to right, except for the squad leader. And if you're in a scenario that uses him, the platoon guide who is going to go to the back. Then I'm going to resolve one card at a time using the AI little flowchart to determine what their action should be. Now, scouts and riflemen are the most complicated ones, so it's good to get them out of the way. You'll see that the scout has a different set of actions based on whether they have an objective or pinning goal for the scenario. In this case, they're doing the objective one. So first, if an AI rifleman needs scouting to double progress towards a preferred objective, the scout will scout. If riflemen don't need them to scout things out, they'll recon to get rid of Fog of War if they can. Then they'll see if they can attack someone with 4-6 to six defense, and if they can't even do that, they'll just conceal and add a Fog of War to my deck. Now to figure out this whole rifleman progressing and scout progressing thing, we've got the two most text heavy cards in the game, but let me just kind of walk you through it. So the first key thing to figure out is which objective does the rifleman want to move towards? And I have a little formula for this on the cards. You take the victory point value of the tile, like two here, subtract the distance from the rifleman, so this is one away, so that would go from two to one. And then if the objective is enemy controlled and at least one enemy unit could move there with a single action, you subtract one. If it's enemy controlled and there's an enemy sitting on it defending it, making it impossible to control it for now, you subtract two. And this is Mike with a quick addition I made after recording. If they've scouted the tile but don't control it yet, you subtract half a point, which basically just affects tiebreakers. If they're tied, they're going to go for the one with the higher objective value. So just for this first turn, let's work out all the values and just kind of show you how it's done. So they'll ignore any of the already control. They don't need to do anything for those. For this one, it's got two minus one distance, so that's a one value, no enemy control messing with it. For this one, it's two minus three distance, so negative one. For both these rivers, they're one and two tiles away, so also negative one, tied with this. For this one, it's a one, it's three away, so that's negative two, and it's enemy controlled with a unit on it, so that's negative four. And finally, this one is three, and it's one, two, three, four away, so that's also negative one. This is Mike popping in again. With that being scouted, it would be negative 1.5, which you'll see will be a key thing in a moment with the AI's decision, and will make them a little smarter. So for now, the clear winner is this two tire right next to the rifleman. So now what the scout wants to do is scout the way for riflemen to go into the objectives they want to go to. But they'll only do that if they're the closest scout to that rifleman. Otherwise, they'll let the other scout handle it. So like in this case, scout A would do something else instead of scouting for rifleman B. But here what he's going to prefer to do is move in here and scout it for the rifleman. He's got one movement left, and generally he'll stay put unless there's another objective adjacent, so he's going to scout the river as well. And remember, two tiles scout is going to add two fog of war to the AI's discard pile. I also added one to my pile, I forgot to say that. Okay, next is the Rifleman, and they have a very simple set of actions, minus all the stuff we just talked about. If they're on a tile they can control, they're going to control it. If not, they're going to move towards an objective, as long as they can move at least one space towards it, whichever one they prefer. And if they can't move towards it at all, like it's not scouted yet usually, they're just going to attack whoever they can. So in this case, Rifleman B is going to move right here in prep to control this next time and get them four out of their six objective points. 
And then Squad Leader B could bolster their deck, but look, their first priority is if a Rifleman can control, they're going to inspire them to do so. And that does work out because they're from the same squad, so he's going to have Rifleman B grab this building right away, as I would if I was playing too. And that's it, we discard their five cards, and we go back to drawing and doing initiative. And this time for me, I got uh, two of my leaders who can bolster and two Fog of War. So I'm clearly going to use Fog of War for initiative because it doesn't matter much if I go first or second. I'm just going to add cards to my deck. Let's check the AI. There's their initiative card. They need one more, so they're going to reshuffle their deck. And they use their platoon sergeant for initiative. See, this is why they need an extra card sometimes. So they're definitely taking initiative, which means they'll win the tiebreaker in the future. Okay, we flip. We got two scouts, Rifleman A, and then remember the squad leader goes in the back. So Scout A is again going to check if the nearest Rifleman needs scouting. And they don't, because their new preferred objective is right next to them, and they can move in and control that already. So Scout A does not need to scout. So their next priority is a recon, but the AI didn't draw any Fog of War cards. So now are going to see if they can shoot someone for 4-6 to six defense. And they can indeed, bad for me, because both Rifleman A has 6 defense, 4 plus 2 distance, and so does Rifleman B. Now, Attack Priority has its own card, and you'll see that in objective goal scenarios, they want to shoot Rifleman first, so this works out for them. So they're going to look for Rifleman to shoot. They want the one with the lowest defense. In this case, it's tied. Then they want the one closest to an objective not controlled by the human player. And here they're also tied because they're each one away from a tile that I don't control yet. So the final tiebreaker is just A over B over C. So they're going to shoot Rifleman A, which is the one I totally didn't want. Now, they will check if they can shoot somebody else who has two lower defense than the eventual target they figure out, just so they don't, like, kind of give up an easy shot on somebody in the same space. But nobody has four defense here, so the scout's going to shoot Rifleman A. And, ah, they hit. So that means my one Rifleman A card from my discard, the only one of its kind in my deck, is gone. So next up is Scout B, and he doesn't care about Rifleman B. He only wants to help out the Rifleman closest to him. So we have to say, what objective does Rifleman A want to progress towards? So these ones down here are minus one, this one is minus one, and this one is minus one. Hey, and this is Mike from the future again. Last time I'm going to jump in. So for this video, I would have just gone to the tiebreaker, and they're going to head towards the three, which is a dumb move, and you'll see why it's dumb as the AI acts it out. But with the new rule where you subtract 0.5 when it's a scouted tile, they would head towards the 2 to their east, which is clearly a better move for them to take. And he next wants to check if the Rifleman can progress two tiles along its way to that objective, and no, he can't, because we only have one tile scouted. So in that case, the scout is going to scout. But if, let's say, there were already, like, two scouted tiles along this way, he would not scout. Now, either of these would get the Rifleman closer to the objective, but the AI is going to choose higher cover when they can, so the scout will move there for his first move. But now these are equal in the scout's eyes, so I'm going to have them do what I think is probably the dumber thing and scout down here because I have player choice when everything else is equal. Because very shortly I'm going to take control of this bridge and the AI will say, what the heck, I don't want to go there. So then I'll kind of force the scout to go up here and add an extra fog of war to the deck. All right, next is Rifleman A. He's going to truck along behind his scout. And we have a different situation with squad leader A because the Rifleman can't control. So we're going to check the second action, priority bolster. So what does priority bolster mean? So for both objective and pin scenarios, I've given the number of cards the AI wants to not have in their deck. That means in their supply plus out of play cards. And how I mark that is when a unit gets damaged, I put the card back in the same supply row, but I flip it face down. So I can see at a glance that Rifleman B has four cards in supply plus out of play, and the AI wants them to only have two, which means they want to bolster some of those cards into their deck. And a priority bolster to trigger that early action by the leader in this case is when the AI is two or more total above the desired value in the types of units they can order. So here we're only paying attention to the Squad A people, including the three Squad A machine gunners. So we check how far off they are. For machine guns, they want to have two and they have three, so they're one off. For scouts, they want to have one out of play and they have two, so they're one off. And for riflemen, they are two off. They have four and they want to have two. So they're first going to bolster the ones that are furthest off from the desired value. So they're first going to spend one to get Rifleman to be only one above what they want. But when they're tied, as they are now, because Machine Gun Scout and Rifleman are all one more than they want, they're going to bolster a Machine Gun, the first one that shows up. So that took a bit to explain, but in the end, the Squad Leader A bolstered a Rifleman and a Machine Gun. So now I get to do my turn, and with two Fog of Wars, I'm just going to bolster. I mean, I guess I could command with a Platoon Sergeant, but I'm about to reshuffle, so I'd rather get some good cards in my deck. So I'd also like to get some Machine Guns. Let's get two Machine Gun A's for the Platoon Sergeant. Actually, listen now. Let's make it two Machine Gun B's for the Squad Leader, because Rifleman A and Scout A are my ones who are charging towards objectives at the moment. So let's get two Rifleman A's and a Scout A for the uh, ones for my Sergeant. I'm right, going to turn three. Let's see. Hmm. Got two machine guns, a rifleman, and a scout. 
Let's see, the Rifleman and the Scout actually could progress towards an objective on the river, so let's uh, use a machine gunner for my initiative, I guess. Meanwhile, the AI is gonna use a Fog of War, so they will be after me. So if he were to play my machine gunner first, which by the way spawns him on this all square, and I get to take an immediate action with him, and I think I'm gonna shoot at this Scout, who's left himself pretty close and on a zero cover space. So I need a seven on two dice, and remember, more than one roll doesn't mean that I hit him twice, I just hit him once. Now another small rules change here, I don't immediately discard a card for Scout B because I don't want to peek at the AI's hand and give myself too much information. So I just put one of my scouted tokens on him and that'll remind me at the beginning of the AI's turn, see if I hit any Scout B cards. Or meanwhile, I think Scout B is going to scout and the Rifleman's going to move. And even though it's going to be probably more Fog of War than I want, I'm going to get the entire river scouted just to give me an easy victory potentially. And then Rifleman B is going to truck on up and at least threaten that path to victory. So now we reveal the AI cards and see if we hit a Scout B, and we did not. So as per normal rules, I'm going to go through their discard pile, deck if I have to. And remember, I'm going to put it back in the supply, but face down to influence possible bolster actions for the AI later. So all they've got is a Rifleman B and a Squad Leader B and then a bunch of Fog of War. Oh, so this is not going to be good. Rifleman B is going to move, and then because he can control, the Squad Leader is going to get his card back and allow him. So they're at five out of six victory points. If they can take this river space right next to them, I am done. All right, back for another round. Speaking of Fog of War late in hands, I do have a double Rifleman A action, but... Yeah, actually, that's pretty good. I can grab that uh, three victory point bridge with it. But I'm clearly going to use a Fog of War for my initiative. The A is about to reshuffle, so I'll grab that for their initiative, and then shuffle and take their four cards. And, oh, interesting, I have the tiebreaker, so they are actually going to go after me, even though they played the same card. So yeah, while I have the chance, I'm going to move Rifleman A over, use the squad leader to inspire his card back, and control. So I'm at four victory points, almost five. Got a platoon sergeant, they'll go first, then scout A, then machine gunner, then fog of war. So platoon sergeant always checks for that priority bolster first. Hey, are we uh, two above where we want to be for the entire group? And then only if that fails will he command. And wow, we're one above here, two above here, one above here, uh, two above here, one above here, so yes. So highest above are Scout B and Rifleman B. Uh, he'll grab one of each of those. Don't grab the damage card. And now with literally everybody except Machine Gunner A being one above where they want to be, he's going to grab his other machine gun. All right, next is Scout A. He's going to check if Rifleman B wants to progress. And indeed he does. This is a one minus one distance of zero for him. This is a 1 minus 2, so negative 1 minus 2 more for me controlling it. Or only minus 1 because nobody's on it. This is a 3, but 3 distance, so a 0, but then minus 2 for control and a unit on it, so it's down to a 1s. Then this one is 3 minus 3 for distance, so it's at 0. But then it's minus 2 because I control it and have units on it, so he definitely prefers the one right next to him. So the scout's going to scout it, and then again, kind of unwisely, but just because he always wants to do this, he's going to scout the next one as well. They definitely want to get those objectives scouted. And now Machine Gunner A is going to spawn. And Machine Gunners are pretty dumb. They'll attack. Uh, if their target has 4 to 7 defense, they'll do a regular attack. If they have 8 to 9 defense, they'll suppress. Only if they have 10 defense or above and the gunner can move closer, then they'll move closer to try to get a better shot next time. And remember, in this objective scenario, he's going to prefer the Rifleman with the lowest defense unless somebody else has 2 lower defense than that. So definitely he'll be gunning for my Rifleman B, who has only 6 defense, so he's going to do a regular attack. And definitely hits. Man, oh man, I need to bolster pretty badly. All right, so let's see. Ooh, okay. So I got a Scout A, which is the one that can get me up to that building up to the north. Squad Leader B is going to be good to bolster my guy who just got hurt. I could bolster with Platoon Sergeant, but I think I might actually command with him. Let's do that first. Or wait, I got to do my initiative, don't I? So yeah, let's uh, play the Fog of War again. And their first card is a Rifleman. They're going to get initiative. And wow, a lot of Fog of Wars. Yeah, they've definitely built them up. So Rifleman A and then Squad Leader B. So as I said it would, Rifleman A's world has rearranged quite a bit. He thought he wanted to go down to this bridge, but now that's three, three away, zero, but minus two for being enemy held and controlled. Compared to this one, two and two away, just a straight up zero, he would much rather go there. But whoops, he can't because it's not scouted. So he's also going to take a shot at the weakest Rifleman. Uh, B is a six, A is a seven. Oh, God, of course he hits. Yeah, this is pretty bad, because Rifleman B don't have any of those cards left, which means now I've left it open for their Rifleman B to run in here and get the win. He is off the board. Meanwhile, Squad Leader B can't inspire anybody, so he's going to bolster. And looking at just the Bs, the Machine Gunner's where they want him to be. Rifleman's one above, Scout's one above, so he'll do one of each of them. So he's gotten his last Scout B card since the damage happened. All right, I got to get something going on here. Let's uh, use a Platoon Sergeant to command, I guess. 
Uh, Lord, Lord, Lord. Yeah, I'll come in. All right, I got a lot of units now. So let's see, my main choices are, huh, I have to try to either get Rifleman B back and go control that to deny it, or I could just run Rifleman A over there, say forget it to the building since they aren't really scouting over there yet anyway, but then I'll be in terrible cover for their machine gunners to cut me down. But yeah, I don't want to add more Fog of War to my deck, so I'm going to ignore the building for now. I'm going to have Rifleman A run over. Squad Leader B is going to get me two Rifleman B cards to get them back in the fight. Now Scout A, hmm. The AI is just about to shuffle, so I think I'm going to actually conceal twice and just try to really jam them up with Fog of Wars. They're already pretty bad on that count. I could take the shot at Rifleman B instead, but I feel like other units will have a better time with that. All right, come on, give me some machine guns or something good. Ooh, nice. Okay, um, Scout B is right on the same spot as Rifleman B, so that would give me a nice shot. And then between the Rifleman A and the Squad Leader A, I can take control of the river that's in jeopardy. So, yeah, I guess even though I was about to bring them back to life, we're going to initiative with Rifleman B. Although it'll be terrible if they win initiative, because they'll probably shoot at Rifleman A and take that card out of my hand. Ah, awesome, they did a Fog of War, which makes sense, because they have so many of them, so I'm going to go first. Okay, so Rifleman A, move in. Squad Leader, get him back. Control it. We've got five of six. Just need the one they control. And Scout B is going to take a shot at Rifleman B because it's a four. I mean, he's right on the same spot. Come on, take him down, take him down. Yes. So now I can check if they had a Rifleman B card. Yeah, they did. Get out of here. So I mean, the AI is down to Scout A, and then Rifleman A, and then Squad Leader A. So Scout A does not pay attention to Rifleman A because Scout B is closer. So he checks if Rifleman B can progress towards his next objective. And interestingly enough, all of the objectives are at minus two right now, mainly because of my control modifier. So that means Rifleman B wants to get over here. He can progress at least two spaces, so Scout A does not want to scout for him right now. Scout A can't recon, no fog of war. So, of course, Scout A is going to shoot my little Rifleman here with a five. <laughs> no. So there goes that card from my discard pile. Next is Rifleman A. And he still very much wants to go to that building, but Scout B hasn't gone yet, so he's just going to shoot as well. And of course it's a Rifleman A. Yeah, he missed! And the Squad Leaper only inspire Rifleman A if he can make progress. Scout A if he's the scout who would make scouting for him, so neither of those applies. So he would inspire the Machine Gunner, but we didn't have one of those cards. So he's going to bolster instead, which suits him fine, because both Rifleman A and Scout A don't have as many cards as they want in there. Alright, things are getting pretty desperate on my Rifleman front. They just need to bolster a heck ton of Rifleman, and maybe a bunch of Gunners, and just blast this guy to smithereens and take that last river space. And that's certainly not going to be easy to do with that hand. <laughs> I'll initiate with one of the Fog of Wars, and then I'll plan to recon out another one. Meanwhile, the AI will also do a Fog of War, so I win the tiebreaker. And like I said, we're going to recon away a Fog of War first, and draw a replacement. And we get Machine Gunner B. See, so yeah, let's have him try to smash their rifleman. Boom! And let's see if we got lucky and hit again. <laughs> yes, we did. But he is activating anyway, man, but that's all he's got. So he's gonna charge in here. All right, turns are flying fast now. Hmm. Okay, then we're gonna do the Fog of War. I did want to uh, recon it out of my hand and draw something else, but I really wanna get Rifleman B in play and the squad leader, and I don't wanna throw away their scout. Oh, and the AI threw away Machine Gunner, so he's gonna get initiative, but I'm okay with him not shooting me more. Right, let's see what they got. Scout B, Rifleman A, Fog of War, Machine Gun. So the scout will be first. I know this might not be good. They are going towards the objective to help out Rifleman A. <laughs> Funnily enough, they only have one Fog of War card left in their supply, so they're going to get away with one. And then Rifleman A is going to advance over there. This is not good. And then finally Machine Gunner A is, I imagine, going to blast the heck out of Rifleman A? Of course. Uh, yep. In this case, I do have to dig in my deck for, I think, the only Rifleman A card I have right now. All right, meanwhile, for me, I'm going to bring Rifleman B back into play and move him up. Use a Squad Leader to inspire him and run him over here. Oh, we can win if we just grab that before they get back. And then Scout A... He's going to try to shoot the Rifleman, who's the only guy who can get back to defend it. Six, come on, come on, come on. Yes! And look, this is beautiful. They don't have any more Rifleman B cards until they bolster. And, oh man, <laughs> this is the perfect hand unless they uh, use their nine for initiative. They have the tiebreaker. I'm going to use my platoon sergeant, get the Rifleman B, and win the game with that. So let's flip over their top card. What? No! Are you... <laughs> no way! Well, I still might get lucky if, like, these are all Fogs of War. And they are except Scout B. Boom, we still got it. Well, I should say we probably got it, because Scout B doesn't need to scout for their Rifleman, so they're going to trash a Fog of War card. And draw another Fog of War. Yeah, they got way too many of those. Now, here's why it would have mattered if they'd gotten any of these units, something I didn't mention yet. 
for any AI unit, no matter what the type is, if they activate and they're within movement range of one of their objectives that a rifleman could control in their next action, they'll use all their movement to run back there and deny them the victory points. If I'd gotten Scout A, he would have run back. If I got Rifleman B, he would have run back and protected from the quick win, which likely would have given them enough time to get Rifleman A over here and grab that objective. But I survived the fire. Rifleman B grabs the last tile on the river. And there you go. That's Undaunted Normandy, my solo variant for it. And except for a small tweak I might try here or there, it's basically done, so go try it out. And if you want to almost assuredly lose instead of uh, barely winning like I just did there, try out drawing five cards for the AI instead of four each round. Good gaming, everyone, and I'll see you at the next stop.